Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our spotlight talk on material combinations in the studio. My name is Maria. I'm the visitor engagement manager at the Wharton Ashrick Museum. Today, I am joined by communications and public programs director Katie Wynn. We're very happy to be here with you. Thank you again for joining us. I'm going to go start by sharing my screen. Okay, so the museum has been closed for the better part of the last year, and we recently announced plans to resume tours on June 3rd. We're very excited about that. Um, shameless plug, you can make a reservation on our website, wartonashworkmuseum.org. Um, so while we're looking forward to that, we're also really looking forward to continuing with these um, virtual programs. In case you're not familiar with our spotlight talks, every month we have these very brief virtual talks where we take a closer look than we might otherwise be able to on a regular tour at a different piece or group of pieces in our collection. Um, pre previous talks as well as other previous virtual programs are available on our YouTube channel and you can also view the past programs page of our website. Next month, we're going to focus that spotlight on some of Eshrick's numerous models that are on view throughout the studio, so be sure to join us for that. And um, we will also have the next in our uh, curator, cura curator conversation series, excuse me, a conversation between our Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships, Emily Zilber, and Beth Good Goodrich, at the, li um, the librarian at the American Craft Council, and that'll be on June 10th. Returning to today's program, um, should you have any questions while we're talking, go ahead and put them in the chat. Emily Zilber is here with us today, standing by to help answer them. And we've also set aside a few minutes at the end to address them. So if you'd prefer, um, you can just unmute yourself and shout them out then. We do ask that you please keep yourself muted until then because there is a lot to show you. But if you're comfortable, go ahead and turn your video on. I wanted to start by talking about the inspiration for today's program, our annual um, woodworking competition and exhibition. Every year since 1994, we've called on woodworkers from all over the world to submit their work based around a theme that Wharton would have done himself. So we've done lighting, we've done jewelry, cabinets, stools, you name it. This year, the theme was wood end, dot, 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 asking people who are entering to combine wood with some other material. The exhibition can be viewed in its entirety on our website, wartonestrickmuseum.org slash programs and exhibitions slash wood end. The first three prize winners work will be on view in the visitor center at the museum as well, and that's what you see here. We've got first place um, Aspen Golan for partially draped cabinet combining wood, metal, and glass. Second place, uh, Christian Burchard for riff on a Donzo Ngoni combining wood and rawhide, which you will see from Eshrick today. And third place, uh, Jason Turnage for factory low stool combining wood and metal, which I'm also going to show you a few examples of today. I encourage you to check out the recording from the virtual opening reception, which happened just a week ago today, um, to hear the artists speak about their pieces. That's on our YouTube channel. So the theme for this year's show uh, came to be um, as this was something that Wharton did throughout his career, combining wood with other materials. He was always experimenting with new, new materials and more often than, than not combining them with wood in some way. So just as he blended materials, he often blended the old and the new and the functional and the sculptural. And therefore his reasoning for, for blending materials seems to be some sort of combination usually of functional and sculptural. And I will talk more about that as I get into a few examples. So I'm gonna start by showing you a few specific examples from inside the studio. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Katie, um, who's gonna kind of zoom out and talk a little bit more about the, the spaces and the buildings as a whole. Of course, he combined um, materials for functional purposes to upholster chairs, among other reasons. Take a look at these two. Now, when you first look at them, they probably don't seem terribly similar. They use different materials, of course. We have maple for the Hessian Hills chair on the left and hickory and oak for the hammer handle chair on the right. The Hessian Hills chair combines wood and rawhide, while the hammer handle chair combines wood with painted canvas belting. They obviously differ in design and quite a bit in construction. When you take a closer look at them, they actually have more in common than you might think. 
Um, interestingly enough, both served at some point as a form of currency. The Hessian Hills chair you're looking at as a prototype for a student and teacher chair um, for the Hessian Hills School, a progressive type school in New York. And the chairs were exchanged uh, for his daughter Mary's tuition. The Hammer Handle chair served a similar purpose. It was tuition for his daughter Rose's apprenticeship at the Hedgerow Theater School. In case you're not aware, the Hedgerow Theater is a small local community theater. It's about 20 miles away from the studio and still exists today. Eshrick history and Hedgerow history very closely intertwined. Um, so for that chair, that hammer handle chair, he had won about 400 hammer handles at auction. To you or I, that probably seems pretty useless, but not to Warden. Interestingly enough, he used them to make about 45 of these chairs in four different iterations. Um, and usually there were only ever just a few, so that's pretty rare. Moving along, um, ample examples of wood and metal, as I mentioned, just as we see in the woodworking exhibition this year, arguably the most notable of which being the flat top desk, this one you're looking at here. Um, what you're looking at is a 1929 piece, so really nicely uh, coincides with his burgeoning interest in German expressionism with that kind of triangular form it's got. As you'll note from my caption, the end comes in at the top, it's aluminum which at that time had just become commercially viable. Um, Eschrick never, really, never shied away from a challenge. He was always gonna experiment even with, with new things. He would of course find that aluminum wasn't really cutting it um, from a functional perspective. I don't know about you, I can't really imagine having a metal desk. Um, so he opted for wood instead. He explained that wood was quote, warmer. I love how he combines the old and the new here and how his work kind of keeps evolving. That original aluminum didn't go to waste though, it ended up getting recycled into things like light poles. There's one hanging right over um, the desk in the studio today. So then we have that, that 1962 wooden top that, um, that he replaced the, the original aluminum top with, and this is what the desk looks like now. The wooden metal theme extends into the kitchen as well. Um, he added his own carved wooden lid to a pot, as you can see on the left here. I think it's just so interesting. Um, we're not really sure about a date for this one. We think it's probably early because of that rougher pattern of carving. And we've got the toasting forks here. They're iron with uh, walnut handles. They may look like antiques, but we actually think that he might have made them himself. He made or had made um, various iron works at a local forge not far away from the studio. So after that look at a few specific examples um, of pieces in the studio, I'm gonna hand it over to Katie, who again is gonna sort of zoom out a little bit and talk a little bit more about the spaces as a whole. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Maria. So yeah, I think as we were um, thinking about the wood and theme and how it related to Asterix Studio, we kept coming back to the idea of the structure itself as this kind of total work of art. So um, I think most of you know, this is built over a 40 year period. It starts in 1926. He adds a wood addition in 1940 and then the stuccoed silo in 1966. And I think part of the thing that's really fascinating about it is that it is very eclectic um, and yet it all kind of gels together. I think because of the way that he's kind of handling materials in a similar way. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, Maria, I'm sharing here just a couple of photos of the stone, which is from the oldest section of the building. Um, he was definitely being very resourceful in the earliest period of the studio. He was, um, you know, working on the cheap and using what he could get a hold of. Um, but I think at the same time, he was being very thoughtful and very careful about the materials that, that he was using. And he was able to sort of find the value in these materials that maybe weren't necessarily expensive. So this is all, um, or for the most part, hard sandstone, which is something that local quarries were not using for their lime kiln and you know, other uh, industrial uses. And so he specifically chose um, these stones and he would arrange them um, in a very particular way. So for example, near the front door, which is the blue door that we're looking at here, he would choose ones that had sort of a plum color to them. He would even choose the, the more natural sides to face out. 
so that you would actually be able to enjoy and experience them. If it had a really straight kind of industrial cut side, that would be hidden inside the wall. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, Maria, this resourcefulness and this approach to kind of gathering materials from different places, bringing them together, definitely followed through inside the studio as well. Um, so the beams that he used to, to build the oldest part of the studio were sourced from other buildings. Um, they are like hand hewn, you know, beams from the 1700s from old barns and mills and the north window, which is this nice, I guess you could say it's like a frosted or textured glass window, um, is also from a previous structure. So he was able to source that and kind of pull them all together. But he wasn't always being uh, strictly resourceful or strictly uh, functional with these choices. And if you go to the next slide, Maria, I have this metal floor grate, um, which is also from 1926. So um, Eschrich has built his new studio. It has a packed earth floor on one section and wood on the other. And there's a little bit of uh, venting of sort of moving air around under the floor. And rather than using something entirely, you know, standard, he took, um, he took a wood box and went down to a local foundry and drew this, this grate into the, the casting sand. So essentially you have a box of sand and anywhere that gets uh, impressed is going to be where that liquid metal flows. And so he drew out his own grate. And rather than do, um, just a, a design, he actually drew uh, a little map of the studio and where it's located. So it's a little hard to you know, make out, I'm sure, looking at this, but if you can see that there's a compass sort of in the upper left, uh, below that, you kind of see this shape that looks like a hill. That's actually a road that used to cross between where the farmhouse was, where the family lived and where the studio was. So it's a little hard to make out there is a little block that's the house and a little block that's the studio on either side of that line. Um, so I think really, you know, even though this is all one material, he's incorporating into the floor and it's a way of thinking about how do I change all of the aspects of the architecture to be personal and, and unique. And then in the next slide, I'm showing a kind of a different take on that where um, when Eschrich added his 1940 edition, so he had his earliest stone portion, he adds this wood addition. And when he does that, uh, there's this great opportunity to combine the stone and the wood. So on the left is the dining room in 1947. And if you notice on the left wall, there is uh, stone that was once the exterior of the house and it bulges out at the bottom. And that was where the chimney was on the outside and still is underneath there. And then later on, he added a bench and he kind of hid that bulge underneath. And if you go to the next slide, Maria, um, you can see where he has scribed the top of that bench shelf in this beautiful way to kind of match the stonework that was there. And then that actually lifts off. So he has storage behind there. It's actually uh, Eschrick's liquor cabinet is the, the space if you could lift that off. And then in the next slide, I'll show that there's also storage underneath as well. So very much like a sailboat, right? This is, this is something that he is drawing from a lot, that kind of smart storage spaces that you see in places like sailboats. And under here, I tried to take a picture because this is something we never get to show on tours because we'd have to crawl under the table together. Um, but you can see under there as well how about half of that storage space is actually taken up by the stone. And he had to kind of incorporate those two pieces together. And then let's go to the next slide, Maria. So I'm showing here just sort of a collection of spaces um, because I think that um, in addition to this sort of eclectic use of materials, um, for example, on the left, there's a photo of the bedroom and it has this material called Celatex, which is like a crushed or a, like a sugarcane fiber that's, that's mixed with an adhesive. And then on the right, you have the kitchen, which has this um, plaster painted wall. So you can see where like he's pulling all these different materials together. It's almost like every room has a different um, kind of 
ensemble of materials. Um, but he is also, I think, making some really interesting choices where he doesn't do a lot of um, hiding of materials. So in the way that lots of us have, um, you know, you have studs and then you have drywall and then you have wallpaper maybe and you have trim and there's a lot of ways that materials are organized to kind of hide the things underneath. Eshik is really using materials really directly. So, so like just as it is, um, here's the cellotex. Most people probably didn't have that out and exposed uh, in their structures. Or even if you can make out in the uh, kitchen area, there are some stone shelves that are the um, kind of the shelf for the fireplace or the windowsill. So everything's kind of like really direct and really um, the integrity of whatever that material is, is, is being used to its fullest extent. And I also think that that extends, you know, beyond the walls and, and the sort of architecture to a lot of the found objects that we see incorporated into the space. So I've got a little picture up above of uh, these oxtail bones, which are a light switch. And then if you go to the next slide, Maria, there's also a mastodon tusk hand railing, which I, I wanted to just sneak in here um, because it's a great example of the kind of looseness that Eshrig brought to the space. And he was, uh, I think it adds a lot of this sort of welcoming feeling to the space where in one way he's being, you know, incredibly thoughtful with these finished designs. And then in other moments, he can just throw something up on the wall, like a mastodon tusk or maybe a lampshade that's a piece of rawhide or it's a pot lid and it just works because it is done with that same sort of uh, joyful sort of one-off. If it works, it works. Um, in this case, the mast on tusk was a gift and the story is that he sort of carried it around the studio until boom, it fit right there by the staircase and, and that's where he kept it. And so in the photo on the right, you can also see uh, that floor grate, if you look down to the bottom right of the photo, you can see that as well. And then if we go to the next slide, I just wanted to end uh, back out, you know, looking at the whole structure and mentioning the silo again, because I think that that is architecturally a really unique moment. Um, he called it a silo, of course, it's actually where his kitchen is. Um, but that painted structure is concrete block that's covered in stucco. And the color was really all added in one day, one fall day in 1966. Uh, the colors were mixed into the stucco um, as it was applied to the side there. And Miriam, his companion would sort of say it was like uh, he was a conductor where he, cause he was older, he was in his seventies. So he didn't go up on the scaffold. He had the guys that were up there kind of add the color to his instruction, you know, more yellow this way and more blue that way. Um, but I think it really kind of brings it full circle into how he was thinking about the whole building as a sculptural space um, and even thinking about it a little bit as a painter, which he certainly was. So um, with that, I actually do have one last slide in there just to mention our artist in residence, Roberta Massage. She is a ceramic artist um, who has been working over the last year uh, to make works uh, in response to Eshrick Studio. So these pieces are gonna be on display when we reopen. And so we're really excited that we'll continue to have these dialogues between different materials happening in the studio. And with that, I think we should open it up to questions. We really crammed a lot in today. So I'd love to hear if anybody has any comments or things they're curious about that we, that we talked about. It, you can put it in the chat or if you like, you can just unmute yourself and, and chime in. If I may. <laughs> Please, welcome Rob. Yes, um, I just wanna say um, job well done. Thanks to all the staff for keeping the story alive through these challenging times. And I wish her well with the reopening. Thank you. Yeah, we're really excited to be um, bringing people back through the space again. It's been a long, it's been a long time. And, you know, there's nothing better than showing people the space. Amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you'll be helping us, right? I hope so, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. If you'll allow me. <laughs> 
We certainly will. And are there any other uh, comments or, or questions about the space? We are going to be reopening on June 3rd um, by reservation, of course. That's nothing new for us. Um, yeah. I'll just dive in and say this was really wonderful and I am still processing. Still sure. absorbing. I'm mm -hmm. still thinking about the stones being with the rough sides being on the outside and the smooth sides being on the inside. Mm -hmm. um, well, just everything, every image that you had was, is so rich and full of so many dimensions. And then I thought, imagine spending your life just responding to your muse in this way without any I mean just being able to spend sort of every hour of every day and imagine the hours required to build hand build your own home in that way it's amazing it's really mind-boggling yeah I mean I think you really hit it right on the head that you you know it was a it was a every aspect of his life is sort of embodied in all of those objects and in the house itself. Um, and it was totally intertwined, right? Like, because it would take all day, every day, not that it was all hard labor, but um, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's why he'll always be relevant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I clearly, I, you know, I was so excited to, to pull this particular spotlight together because I felt like uh, there's so many ways about how he handles materials that feel super relevant today to, to artists continuing to make and to people like Roberta Massage coming in and, and responding to the space, so. Is there a publication that has more of the old pictures from the, the early days of the studio? I've been there many, many times, but to see the first iteration is was interesting to me. Yeah, there's um, I think a couple of publications that have some great photos. Um, one is by Mansfield Bascom, which is okay. Morton's son-in-law, um, who wrote the the big biography. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also one called uh, Birth of the American Modern that has a lot of archival um, information in it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It was neat to see little corners that we don't often see. So thanks for that. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah. I see a, a question in the chat, a good one. Where would someone procure a mastodon tusk? That is a good question. Um, it was uh, found um, by the son of a friend while he was mining in Alaska. So. I don't think you're allowed to just keep it anymore. So <laughs> those were different times. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. Well, thank you all for joining us. I know we, you know, it's a quick, uh, wonderful way to spend your lunch, right? <laughs> yes. Thank um, you. And yeah, thank you all. If you want to, uh, <coughs> Say a goodbye as you sign off. You're welcome to do that. And um, we hope you'll join us for the next one and that you'll you'll make your plans to come visit us in person. Do you know what the subject of the next one will be? Is it about models, Maria? Yes. Yes. Okay. And I just the... that, the one after that, have you planned ahead? I'm sure you have, but. Yeah, yeah, we have a few um, a few coming down the pike. The next one, right, is about the little, the models and the maquettes you see around the studio. Um, That'll be on June 22nd. No. Sorry, right, I don't think I mentioned that. I know we're doing one about um, this wonderful print of Barnicut Bay and some other kind of beach themes later in the summer. Okay. Are, yeah, yeah, there, there's some great ones coming down the pike for sure. Okay. I've also dropped the link to the Wood End show in the chat in case people want to want to go right from here to to explore it. Check it out for sure. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much for coming.
Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Enjoy Thank the day. Thank you very much.